everybody, it's Jason. Again, I, don't, I always I always am about to say you're GM, but I'm not GMing because we we have another dubious knowledge tonight, and tonight is a good one. We are talking for asthma. But before we get into that, Corey, how's it going? It's going well, uh, Jason. Uh, happy to be here again. Always happy to talk about uh, the deities of Galarian with y'all. Um, just, and I needed this today. I had a yeah. long work day, so yeah, I needed this too. I needed this too. It's uh, I had the I had the day off, but. I had a bunch of doctor's appointments, so I'll just leave it at that. But yeah, and Mike, you're, join- you're joining us this week. You're not in the ER this week. No, I'm not. It feels so good to be back, by the way. Also, Phrasma can't get a hold of me yet. I I, uh, I fought back. <laughs> Five IV bags later, I am fit as a fiddle and feeling great. Stomach flus are no joke. Please take right? care of yourself. Drink water. Stay hydrated, right? Stay yeah, hydrated. for sure. Yeah. Uh, I did listen to the Lamashto episode, and I'm kind of bummed because I am the evil god guy. And, I mean, I agree. That was a rough one. It's hard to really go into her lore. But for Asmund lore, I'm super awesome. I'm super excited about And uh, I got some little little, little bits of knowledge and fun facts of uh, yeah. the Lady of Graves. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited, man. I'm excited. Mm-hmm. Like I said at the end of Lamashto... We did one side of the of the childbirth coin. This week we're doing the other side of the childbirth coin. Mm-hmm. And we're also you 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 missed last week. You're joining us this week. Somebody else missed last week, and he's joining us this week. Heath, what's going on, brother? Hey, what's up, dude? How's it going? How 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 are things down there? How about how about how about this? I'm gonna keep it southern. How's the weather down there? Mississippi. Actually, it's a beautiful day in uh, the south of Mississippi. I actually kind of walked around for like 20 minutes outside because I was like, this is just nice. It's like we're in that window right here. It's going to last for about three more weeks, maybe, before it turns into a burning hellscape. So, <laughs> uh, And it'll be like that until September. So we're in, the, we're in the very slim window of it's really nice for the last few weeks and the next couple of weeks. Actually, it rained a ton until last week, so I get about two weeks. I feel like it's the reverse California. It never rains there except for like two weeks and it'll never stop raining. Here, it's always raining. You get about two weeks when it's not miserably hot or miserably muggy and cold. Right on. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I'll go was... for hours. Why'd you even set this up? <laughs> it was it was it was barely barely uh shorts and t-shirt weather we got to 61 degrees today and i was able to rock the shorts and the t-shirt so nice. but let's not belabor the point our special <laughs> guest our special guest this week is none other than Steve Strappel from the Hideous Laughter Podcast. Welcome, Steve. How's it going? Guys, it's so good to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing I'm doing well, brother. I'm doing well. And I mean, we're talking for Rasma. We had to get you on the show because you play Matumbe. Hell yeah. Inquisitor <laughs> of Phrasma. Yes. Yes, Inquisitor of Phrasma in a primarily undead campaign. And I'm loving it. It's a blast. Yeah. Also, yeah. You, your Discord name is Phrasma Saves. How could we not yeah. have you this on is for true. Phrasma? This is true. And would you guys like the, the reason it's Phrasma Saves? Oh, I shouldn't say this. I was, it was just I was drunk. I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, the HLP didn't have a Discord yet. And everybody on the HLP was signing up for Discord names, and I had a couple of beers in me, and because we had already started the campaign at that point, and I was why am I telling this story? And I was playing in Inquisitor of Phrasma, was like, ah, oh, it's like Jesus saves, Matum or uh, Phrasma saves, and I was like, oh, it's kind of funny. I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe it's not that funny, but... I think we I, all it thought it was funny it. until you explained it. That's, yeah. that's what it is. <laughs> no, and, and now it's not, but no. hey, you know? That... that I, that kind of, I, I have to say that I'm, I'm assuming that's the same reason why Brooks is, it's me, sorry. So, 
That is the reason, but that's not his original Discord name. He's gone through a few, and okay. I think every change has happened when he's had a couple beers, yeah. <laughs> so it's me, sorry, is because of beers, but it's not his first name. Right on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Incredible. All right. But so, all right, all right. For asthma. No, I'm sorry, Mike, I interrupted you. You were going to say something. That's fine. It's cool. I'm so used to, I'm used to just, as soon as someone talks, I just instantly go back. I was going to make the joke that Phrasma saves and Abadar withdraws. That was good. (laughs) I like that a lot. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's, it actually works really poor. No, not your joke. Your joke was great. My name actually works really poorly because Phrasma doesn't save anybody. She, in fact, refuses to. Very mm-hmm. much so by the book. Is is actually irritated if someone is saved when it was their time to go. Exactly, yes. <laughs> Spoiler corner on that one. That's going to be something we talk about later so, on. Yes, so, so I think we've... Geez, we've been recording for like five minutes, and uh, we've determined that my username is... A, not clever, and B, not funny. So we're off to a great start. (laughs) But all right, for asthma, Corey, as usual, why don't you give us the the basics and the breakdown? Yeah, so uh, tonight, uh, as we alluded to, we are are talking about for asthma, the, the Lady of Graves, Lady of Mysteries, the Mother of Souls, the Grey Lady, the Survivor, the Spiral of Fate. Phrasma was there when the universe started. She'll be there when the universe ends. Her edicts are to strive to understand prophe- ancient prophecies, to destroy undead, and to lay bodies to rest. Uh, her anathema is creating undead, desecrating corpses, and robbing tombs. She sees over basically all of life. She is the the goddess of birth and the goddess of death, the goddess of fate, prophecy, and time. While we can still talk about alignment, uh, she is a true neutral goddess uh, and allows followers of neutral good, lawful neutral, and true neutral. Uh, in 1E, she also allowed chaotic and chaotic neutral and neutral evil but that has changed as the additions change her domains are death healing knowledge and fate in second edition in first edition she also had uh repose and water her favorite weapon is a dagger her worshippers are typically midwives pregnant women and morticians her centers of worship, uh, basically all of Galarian, but with heavy emphasis in places like Bravoy, Nex, where they are right next door to Geb, uh, Osirian, where they've had problems with undead repeatedly, the Shackles, which I don't actually understand that one, Thuvia, also don't really understand that one. Ustalov is kind of self-explanatory. And, and then right. Varicia, where uh, Varicia is very traditional about god worship, so it makes sense and, that they would worship the oldest god. Yeah, and fate and prophecy play a big part, too, yep. in Varicia. Yeah. Her holy symbol is a clockwise spiraling comet, and her realm is the Boneyard. <laughs> Yeah, I I've always really really liked Phrasma just as a as a cleric player. It's, she's always drawn 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 me. Just the idea of a deity who is bo- who governs both life and death. It was always really interesting. It's so it was something that immediately when I when I started playing Pathfinder this was the goddess that like I latched onto right away. Like I, I got really into her and her lore just because it is so cool. And Mike, you said it, you said it, 
I think it was before we hit the record button. She is a goddess that was there when the universe was born. And she will be there when the universe ends. It, it, legends say that she was the last survivor of the previous universe. And she will be the first creator of the next universe. Or, Not correct. No, she's actually training her replacement. There's mm-hmm. a, uh, a psychopomp that she is training to become her replacement because I guess being there and seeing all that kind of tires you out. I mean, also, Corey yeah. pointed it out that she was there during the beginning. She's one of the pillars of creation with yogg which is a great old one, which I find in- extremely interesting why, you know, the the duality of the great old one. And, I mean, Phrasma technically, I guess, could be considered an old one because she predates everything. Yeah. And rules don't and- apply. Notably, yogg holy symbol is the reverse of Phrasma's mm-hmm. holy symbol. Oh. It is a black spiral going the other direction. That's fascinating. Yeah, and Jason, a little bit like you, when I started playing Pathfinder seriously, I was immediately drawn to Phrasma, although I suspect for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if, if you guys listen to the, the show... It's aesthetic. Yes, and actually... <laughs> Heath, I, no I've joke. heard Jason talk about it enough that I don't think it's that different of a reason, Steve. All right, well, there we go. Uh, but but Heath, yes, I wrote on, on my notes, why do I like Phrasma? Psychopomps, the Boneyard, etc. I'm an emo kid. That's what I wrote. <laughs> I know, you know, I you know, know you Corey, too well. <laughs> yep. So, but, you know what, Corey? I did not I expect... It. I did not expect you to put my horniness on Maine, but you just did, so... <laughs> <laughs> I find a Rosny... Like, that's how I feel about a Rosny. So, I, <laughs> yeah, she can I, get I mean, it. we're in good company Y'all here. Y'all need Jesus. <laughs> I need anyway, asthma. anyway, so yes. <laughs> yeah, emo kid, obviously into it. But the kind of the, the reason that I really attached myself to Phrasma and her faith and all of the cool iconography and stuff that circulates around her is because I just thought it was a really good execution of stuff that I've liked from afar but haven't really involved myself in. I feel like a lot of times, whether it's like on t-shirts or in pop culture or whatever, like grim reaper-y stuff is like usually kind of cringy or edgelordy or like whatever, but I just think that the way that they execute Phrasma with the big gothic architecture and like the little birds wearing masks and like the infinite boneyard, I, th- I just it just clicks for me. It works. I don't think that it crosses that boundary of it being too much or like cringy or whatever. I think it just hits the sweet spot for me. And some people probably disagree with that assessment, but I just really like how she's portrayed. I also think that it's awesome to have a deity that is like kind of above all other deities. She's super powerful. We've talked a little bit about the creation stuff already, and she's just stoic. Like she is 110% impartial and always makes maybe not the call that's going to make everybody happy but it's the right call she's seen every bit of fate she's been there for since the beginning of creation she is stoic and her law her word is essentially law because she knows it's the right call and i think that's just so fascinating yeah i think uh to your point about her being like sort of the uber god being super powerful for me the interesting thing is the combination of that power and the sort of at arm's length, like almost aloofness in in terms of being super impartial, mm-hmm. lends an air of mystery. Like you, like she's inaccessible, you know. Yes. Or, or feels uh, inaccessible, while everyone has to deal within her domains of life and death. You know. Yeah, we were we were talking about this before we hit the record button. To it's, we were kind of planning ahead for spoiler corner, so we weren't just kind of like throwing it on people when people just had to bounce right off but we were kind of scratching our heads because Phrasma plays such a huge role in the world and in the lore but it's to your point Heath it's always a little bit at arm's length like she's always there and present and you feel her and you see some of her iconography and some of her like 
rituals, but it's never the main central theme to an adventure. Like, uh, I, I have a theory as to why that is. So, for Rasma, being the goddess of, of life and death, it works in terms of her relationship to like the AP canon. Like, they should. You never get like a a super phrasmic centric thing, you know, or or like chunk uh, that that I know of. I mean, just based on what you guys are mentioning. But I think that's because she's like a metaphor for the specter of death. Like we live our lives every single day with the knowledge that we're gonna die someday, and we just keep that shit pushed back and at arm's length all the time, because like there's no reason to dwell on it because you've got shit to do, you know. Mm -hmm. I I think she can't leave. The boneyard. I think if she leaves the boneyard, then everything goes, you know, to hell and back, basically. You know, like you said, she's the specter yeah. of death. If she walked on the material plane, death might follow her or rampant, you know. Because she's a great <laughs> old one, right? Yes, because she's basically, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, maybe she's, I think or, she's maybe the pillar, I guess would be the best way. She's the keystone of creation. So if yeah, she imagine, moves or leaves, sorry, Steve. Oh ahead. no, dude, I'm 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 just building off this idea. Yeah, imagine if she steps away for one moment of of judging the infinite like pouring of souls that comes into the boneyard, and they don't start not getting sorted right or whatever. That's going to hell fast, and I guess not capital hell, like capital yeah. H hell, because right. that's a real plane in Pathfinder. Uh, but you know what I mean when I say it's going to hell It's, it's going to get bad, right? <laughs> yeah, it's going to get real well, bad. That, it, that also makes me think of, because for asthma, you think of a stoic and kind of like, if I imagined her like actually doing physical things, it would be very slow and measured. And it's like, she's judging millions of souls all the time. She probably moves really fast, you know, just like, bow, 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 judge, 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 you know? You know, to your point there, Steve, it kind of reminds me of we, we haven't gotten there in book club but uh, Death from Sandman has a mini series where she takes a day off mm -hmm. and this kind of reminds me of that of Death taking a day off and having seeing what happens when nobody dies for a day. Oh, yeah. There was... Um, has anybody on this call watched the show Torchwood? Yes. It's a yes. Doctor Who spinoff. Yes. Yes. But they had that little... Miracle Day. Um, yeah, Miracle Day with the four, five, six or whatever. Yeah. And, boy, th that's a, a little bit of science fiction that will never leave my head when they've got the, like burn victim on the operating table and they try to put it out of its misery and it keeps going and they're like oh god this is going to be so bad if nobody can die <laughs> see I think the opposite I think resurrection magic would fail like if you were brought mm. back from the from the dead using resurrection magic it severs and you're you know you're back well, to where you're supposed to be I think um before before we get too deep we should uh probably talk about her job <laughs> like what does she do? She so for Asma, as we as you as you gathered listening to this, her the main thing she does is she sits in the boneyard, which is her realm, and it overlooks Axis, if I'm not mistaken. Like yep. it, it it overlooks mm -hmm. the it overlooks Axis, and the the mythology is is that there is the river of souls. That when when a when an entity dies in Galarian or in the universe, their soul goes into this river, and the river runs and empties out into the boneyard. And from there, Phrasma, runs through the astral plane. Right. And from there, Phrasma judges the souls and tells them where to, where they go for, for in the afterlife. And so when we're talking about how she she's sitting there judging judging souls, millions of souls, that's what we're talking about. And that's basically what she does. She is the the judge. She is the final arbiter of your soul. Can I add a little something to there, Jason? I I know she she judges the toughest cases. She doesn't judge every single case. Correct. To, to do so, she has these like layers of bureaucratic courts of different like 
psychopomp ushers or psychopomps or whatever that have to carry out her judgment. They speak with her voice. But one of the things that I found really interesting, and I'm sure we're going to touch on like psychopomps and them later. I hope we do because I have a lot of notes on them. Mm-hmm. Is that <laughs> she has a very clear idea of her place in reality and what she needs to do. But she doesn't necessarily communicate that well or how to execute that well to her psychopomp minions so although they share her same ideals of sorting people correctly making sure the dead go where they're supposed to go destroying the undead they all kind of like argue about how that's supposed to be done and stuff it's really interesting i like it yeah yeah and those courts and uh, this is where um, I'm really interested in seeing how this is going to change in the lore coming going forward, because as it stands right now, the courts are are based on alignment, mm-hmm. and alignment. If if you're if you're listening to this, then the announcement came out for Pathfinder Remastered. They're doing away with the concept of alignment going forward. Well, they're doing away with the mechanical concept of correct yeah like there's still going to be alignment in the setting there's still good and evil there's still law and chaos it's just not going to have mechanical effects right so i'm really curious how these courts are going to be yeah how they're going to be um well how segregated is that the word i'm looking for organized delineated delineated Delineated. Mm -hmm. yeah one thing I, I don't find think is much is actually going to change there. It's just going to be you're going to go to to the plane of the the deity that you that you best inhibited in your life, I guess. Um, yeah. Exhibited. Uh, you know, not necessarily having to worship that deity, but if you followed all the edicts of Shellen and whatnot, you're going to probably find your way up to Nirvana. You know, uh, whether or not we have neutral good, the planes still exist, and they're still going to be the the ending spots for souls. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to be as neatly segregated into nine distinct alignments. Yeah. yeah, from from what I understand, the the instead of doing that, like it's just leaning more heavily into edicts and anathema, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's just the um, the courts as they are now are are basically delineated based upon the nine alignments. But I think yeah. the only way to really figure this out is if Paizo publishes a Absalom book sized boneyard book. I think that's what we need. <laughs> You know, a good, good 500 pages on that. Yeah. Just on I all would the be outer okay realms. with that size book just for the planes. Mm-hmm. I think that like, would be great, yeah. Like, they, they had Planar Adventures in first edition, which was a hardcover rule book for the planes there. But it was a little thinner than a lot of the hardcover rule books. To your point, I would love an Absalom, Mwangi Expanse, Impossible Lands size great beyond book just yeah. give me that give me oh, that I'm... deep lore on heaven and elysium and everywhere and we might have to do a dubious knowledge special once uh high helm comes out <clears throat> just just because yes i'm a simp for dwarves <laughs> <laughs> you're dwarf daddy we all know i'm that. dwarf daddy yeah we all know that you're dwarf daddy one of the things i really like about phrasma that was kind of touched on uh, with the with what Steve said earlier about a lot of portrayals of death uh, being cringe and edgy is in the tabletop RPG space a lot of deities of death tend to float closer to those evil alignments and because people fear death and people are like death is a terrible horrible thing 
When in reality, death is just a fact of life. Mm hmm. And, you know, I, I've already talked about Sandman once, but, you know, Sandman really colors my opinion on death because of issue eight of that series, The Sound of Her Wings, does such a good job of showing us that death isn't necessarily just this terrible ending, terrible, horrible thing. It's just something that happens. And yes, it's sad, and yes, it's tragic, but it's not evil. It's just a force of nature, as was earlier said. It happens. And, like, that's one thing that I liked about 4th edition D&D, is that their death goddess was also true neutral. And then I got into Pathfinder shortly thereafter, and lo and behold, their death goddess was also true neutral. And I'm like, well, yeah, I like this, because death isn't good or evil, it's just there. And yeah. I, I think that that's a great way to run a death god, is it's just... It doesn't lean one direction or another because it comes for everybody. Including yeah. you, Aridin. <laughs> well, I, can't, I can't wait to talk about that. Thank you so much, Corey. I cannot, I, that's one of my favorite things to talk about, especially with Phrasma, because there's a little juicy little uh, little lore bit that I find very interesting. My Going off of like pop culture, my thinking of death is from Supernatural. The Reaper from Supernatural. It, they are neutral. They, they, they're not good. They're not evil. They just do what they're supposed to do because without death, there's problems. And, you know, it's just Phrasma and I guess the Raven Queen would be the one for D&D. That was one that came. Mm-hmm. That's the queen, uh, the, the goddess that came out in fourth edition, now in fifth edition. I, I, I like that. Uh, yeah. The Raven Queen, that was, that was an Eberron goddess, right? Was it? Wasn't, was it was fourth edition Eberron? Wasn't fourth edition Eberron? No, fourth edition was the realms, but they kind of pick and chose from various yeah. places. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. If we're go- if we're going off some of our favorite things, I think the thing that stood out for me that I really liked re- when I was reading the lore, when I was reading up on Phrasma, was that she, like. She's she like her her faith and her clergy are super liberal with a under case L, not the not the political sense. Like they really just don't care. Like it's like go ahead and do what you want, be happy. The passage reads here like she encourages her followers to go and procreate. If you're married or if you're just in a partnership, d- it doesn't matter. Just go ahead and procreate. She also supports childless couples. Like, if whatever. Like, if, if, if you're a couple that can't have a child, you're still welcome in the church. You're still welcome in the faith. It doesn't matter. If you want to adopt or you want to run an orphanage and take care of those uh, kids without parents, great. And same thing with weddings in the church. Whether you're, they can be these grand, ornate spectacles. Or it could just be a simple you know, signing of a document type of marriage. It doesn't matter. It's like compared to some of the other gods that we've talked about, like she's super like laissez faire. Like it, it's, mm-hmm. and that's, that's Which what is I funny really because like. She's also out of all the gods that we've talked about so far, including our lost Desna episode that we're going to re-record and get back to. She's also the one that has the most structure. Like she's yeah, the only that, one of the the ones that we've talked about so far that actually has a church structure. Lamashtu has yes. cults that are just all over the place, Whatever. And random. Desna Whatever. just her clerics just do their own thing. Bezzy also <laughs> just do your own thing. Phrasma is the only one of the ones that we've talked about so far that actually has a bureaucratic church structure. Mm-hmm. Where you actually have grandiose temples and a hierarchy of right ranking clergy 
and, and speaking of her temples, they are typically goth cathedrals, like yeah, at, straight out of Tim Burton's Gotham City. Just yeah, these yeah, black, spiky, beautiful, ornate buildings. So the the vibe I got when I was reading that was like medieval Europe, the height of the power of Catholicism. You know, you mean a Gothic cathedral? Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. Like, not just like the visual aspect of it, but like the the um, the structure too, where you have like these high priests. And even the even the prayer services are these somber chants and these ritualized sermons, and then they bring in these the regional aspects, which is something that the Catholic Church very much did. They mix like these somber Latin old school rituals, and then they bring in those regionalized aspects to to like really kind of. Uh, personalize the service a little bit more. It's so interesting because the whole thing really does feel like a big oxymoron or a catch-22, right? We were talking about how the ch- even you know physically the churches are so structured and so ornate and the architecture is incredible. The bureaucracy is thick and heavy and there are bishops and priests and initiates and sermons and clergy and all of that. But then, you know, a couple moments ago, we were just talking about how, you know, she's impartial and there is this concept of just letting life happen. And if your fate is to not have kids, your fate's not to to not have kids. Or if you are destined to procreate, then by all means, go for it. Um, There was a little passage that I saw about how oftentimes Phrasmans will show up after a battle and they you know may not have participated in that battle but they make sure that if somebody needs he- uh, healing no matter what side they were on they're going to get that healing similarly they're going to put whoever needs to get in the ground in the ground so it's 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 kind of tough for me to wrap my head around they seem so structured and they at the same time see so, seem so impartial uh, when we were talking about alignment a while ago, um, I keep wanting to put Phrasma in the lawful neutral box because there is so much structure. lawful, yeah. Yeah, she does feel a little bit more lawful, but yeah. The uh, to Jason's point about about regional flair to Phrasma, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll share this with you later, Steve, because I shared it in a private chat that's just the co-hosts here. Yeah. But, uh... When I do these dubious knowledge, I have so much... So many books in PDF form on my hard drives that I go through typically a good dozen books picking things out to to talk about. And, uh, one of the books that I've that I haven't gotten to use yet that I know will come up frequently in these talks is Inner Sea Temples, which is a oh, book... Oh, deep cut. It is a book with six fully fleshed out temples of mm-hmm. various Galarian deities. We just haven't talked about any of the ones in it yet until today. Because in that book is the High Temple of Phrasma in Sothis in Osirian. Which, for those that are new to Galarian lore, uh, Osirian is Egypt. And it's Mm -hmm. very much a mix of ancient and modern Egypt. But Phrasma is very much worshipped there as a goddess of the dead. Because they've had problems with mummies. <laughs> you don't say. Who would have thought? Yeah. There's yeah. an entire AP dedicated there, there's to There's an it. AP about it. Just, But to, to Jason's point, 
looking at the High Temple of Phrasma and Sothis, it doesn't look like your your big grand Gothic cathedral because it's got the Egyptian flair. Uh, it's a it's a marble obelisk, mm-hmm. and it's it's still very Phrasmin. It has spirals on it. It it still screams Phrasma, but it's not what you first think of when you think of her temples and I really like that that yeah as a deity worshipped worldwide pretty extensively her temples are going to look a little different here and there yeah I was, uh, I was I see this. Ask. yeah Jason you just sent me this cock shaped uh, <laughs> cathedral yeah <laughs> yeah I was going to ask you Steve because I know that for your character, Matumbe. I did not the... know where that was going to go. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to ask you, Steve, because I know you're a fan of <laughs> cock shaped cathedrals. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, Jason. What do you got for me? <laughs> no, I was going to ask because um, your character in Carrion Crown, now that we're. Because if we're talking about Phrasma worshippers mm-hmm. coming from regions other than like Eurocentric and flair. Matumbe is very much an Afrocentric character. So, did you did, were you able to really dig into some of the more Mwangi Phrasma traditions at all when you were when you were researching the character? I I didn't as much as I would have liked to. Keep in mind that when we started the Carrion Crown campaign, Second Edition wasn't even a thing yet. So, like right. when we're talking about the Mwangi Expanse, your resources to draw on are kind of like Heart of the Jungle, which is Ugh. problematic. Yes. And Serpent Skull, which is problematic. And like, right. it's, it's really hard to find stuff that that fits that region of the world that, that probably represents it in the best way. So, so a lot of that early Matumbe stuff... You know, I, I don't want to put the word homebrew on it, but essentially it's just kind of how I envisioned that area of the world without, you know, I, I was trying to stay away from some more harmful tropes. Yeah. So so, so what I kind of settled on was that, and, and this is not a spoiler for, for my character of the campaign, this is like literally episode one, but <laughs> the specific class that I'm playing is an Inquisitor, but more specifically I'm playing an archetype of the Inquisitor, a a pretty strange one called the Living Grimoire, which if you're familiar with first edition, (laughs) Inquisitor keys off of wisdom. Living Grimoire, as as far as I'm aware, is the only version of an Inquisitor that keys off of intelligence instead. And they give away pretty much everything that makes an Inquisitor good in exchange for some stuff that doesn't make it so good. <laughs> <laughs> but the the core base concept of the archetype is that you have a holy book, and that book is bound in iron. And your connection with your deity doesn't come from like an inherent wisdom based connection in the way that like a cleric or a traditional a traditional inquisitor has that sort of innate connection you basically have to research it like you break through with your mind your intelligence so um the way that i made that character work is that um a a ustalavian cleric of Phrasma had her holy text the bones land in a spiral and was visiting the Mwangi expanse and basically dies in front of him and when he picks up the book he's like oh man this lady of graves thing all right and then he's you know feels the call to adventure and the the call from his god Phrasma and then learns how to be an inquisitor and all about this faith as opposed to it being like part of his culture being spoon fed to him so that's really that's really cool I, I hope I did a good job of it. No, I, I... I think you did fantastic, Steve. Thank you very much. I, <laughs> I am on Evil Interlude 10, so right around... So right in the mid-60s of the of the show, and yeah, I think you're doing a fantastic job, and in particular, I think there was a, there was a moment where... And I'm not to get too... I'm not going to get spoilery, but... You have a conversation with another 
cleric of Phrasma in a major city. Mm-hmm. And it was it was it was a great role playing moment. So thank you. But uh, you bring you bring up an interesting point that I wanted to talk about was the holy text. I was the, just gonna segue there, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bones great land lines. the bones land in a spiral. So last last deity we talked about <laughs> She didn't. She didn't have holy texts in the sense that they are holy texts. She had <laughs> tanned yeah. pieces of human skin and a talking skull, uh-huh. <laughs> and a talking skull that speaks like twelve different languages. We're going back to an an, an actual traditional holy text this time around. The bones land in a spiral. Hell yeah. That's my shit right there. You, you know if I'm on a program talking about Phrasma, the book's coming up. We gotta discuss <laughs> the book. Well, what do you want to say about the book, Steve? Oh, I actually don't know too much about the book. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That, that's, all right. that's good, because I do. Oh, well, <laughs> by all means, then then go right ahead. <laughs> I, I have commentary on the book, but you take, take the wheel, Corey. This is you. Yeah, so... Phrasma's holy text, uh, The Bones Land in a Spiral, is a collection of ancient prophecies, because she is the goddess of prophecy. And part of part of her faith is debating what these prophecies actually referenced and what what events they predicted. So there's, you know, controversy within the church of, well, did this predict Starfall or did this predict this or and all of that? And then there's, well, what in this book hasn't happened yet that will happen still? And with prophecy broken, it's a little more confusing, but it's still Phrasma's holy text. It's fair. It sounds, it sounds very like Nostradamus, if if I if I can bring up some, something like, uh, cultural reference. It's like you're looking at Nostradamus's prophecies, and it's like, oh well, what did this? What he said this? What was he predicting? And it did it happen yet? Yeah, there's, and I think this might sort of be where this conversation is going from the, the bones land in a spiral once we get there. But I, and Corey, you can fact check me on this, but there, sh- there should also be like midwife stuff in there for the life there aspect and some death funerary rites and yes. things. Yep. At the end death. of the book, after the prophecies are, are the other parts of her church, the midwifery gotcha. and the, the funeral rites and things like that. You're yeah. absolutely correct, Steve. Because this this has been a very death heavy conversation, but really she's kind of got three pillars to the religion, right? Although today, uh, you know, today in quotes, as in when all the adventures take place post death of Aridin, the prophecy pillar has more or less fallen apart. But it, I don't know. It's it's interesting. A lot of people, myself included, obviously gravitate towards the death, but you know, she has all of these like trained midwives that can give fantasy c-sections don't believe me yeah. it's in uh <laughs> inner sea gods i read that mm-hmm. today yeah yep yep that, a- <clears throat> that was a, a point i was gonna kind of bring up earlier when we were talking about it is that <clears throat> like the aesthetic of of phrasma is is very the like you liked it because the emo aesthetic like it has yes. that gothic cathedral that very dark and death focused aesthetic which feels odd to me that they're not there isn't more of a sort of uh, Caden Kalian quality, not the not in the drunkenness, drunkenness, but the like celebrating of life isn't as prevalent as I would think it would be in a, a you know, a deity in a, a church that is all about life and death. It feels very much on the death end of the spectrum. Yeah, mm-hmm. let's be real. If your wife's about to give birth, you're not bringing her to the place that's like black and covered no. in skulls. <laughs> <and> like- <laughs> Likely it not. Yeah, it doesn't, like, this evoke, doesn't bode like, well. Feel. Right, exactly. Well, you don't take her that, to the Zani K temple? 
Uh, no. <laughs> Just in case, honey, don't worry about it, though. We got really good midwives. <laughs> I do I do okay. like that there's... Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I literally wrote down uh, at the top of the episode that I thought it was interesting. Uh, they're, the listed, like, followers uh, uh, were, like, mothers, midwives, and morticians. And, like, if if we were on my podcast, like, I would have interrupted immediately. Welcome to the Mothers, Midwives, and uh, Morticians podcast. You know, like, <laughs> just such a weird grouping, like... <laughs> a room full of moms, a room full of nurses, and a room full of fucking morticians. And it's like, yeah, this is our social gathering. Don't Very forget nobody the mad great. prophets. Yeah. yeah. Very odd conversations. Yeah. Nobody digs yeah, a great so, like Matumbe, though. No. Hell yeah. I was going to say, Steve, as a compliment, I only know two characters in any of, like, in most you know media that I've thought of that has brought a shovel to a fight. It's Matumbe <laughs> and Korapika from Hunter Hunter. And both of them ended badly for everybody else. Wasn't Rupika, there, uh, red eyes? Well, well, thank you very much. You're I haven't seen welcome. Hunter Hunter yet. I'm, I'm a big anime dude, so I'll have to get on that. Wasn't there some sort of it, like? Oh man, I, I don't know what this it movie Hunter is. Hunter X Hunter. Mm -mm, the X's are always silent. The X is silent. Mm -hmm. It's Hunter Hunter. Okay. It's like Spy X Family is just Spy Family. Mm -hmm. It's like, but it's paper rock mm -hmm. scissors. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that was a Hunter Hunter reference. Anyway. You you, talk, you 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 brought up an interesting point, Heath and Steve. We didn't really talk about the v visual aesthetics of Phrasma other than, you know, goth mommy, which is usually gray skin, white eyes, mm -hmm. and white hair. She is depicted. She she has she has a depiction as a midwife, in mm -hmm. which she is. They say very efficient and severe so she has hair her hair back. pulled her hair's pulled back her arms are bare at the hands and elbows and um then she has the mad prophet side as well where her hair is all tangled and in tatters and in, in a mess and she has wild eyes which is and we'll get into this a little bit later, but that's the depiction that I get when we look at her in Starfinder. Since Starfinder is very much the mad prophet for Asma, mm -hmm. not so much the goth mommy for Asma. And to yeah, be fair, I, I, all three imagery, all three images, they work. Solid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I didn't want to bring it up because I was like, oh, I'll, I'll save it till we get to the Starfinder section. But I did. I posted the picture from. The, the Starfinder book yep. and it is very much like the wild tangled hair white skin crazy looking eyes yeah it's it's. I, I wasn't aware of the three aspects in Pathfinder because I'm you know yeah. relatively new to Pathfinder but yeah based on your description it's very much the Mad Prophet version it's very Galadriel when she realizes oh if I had the ring you know instead Nailed of a dark it. lord yes. you have a dark god yeah. both beautiful and you know stunning as the dawn nice I love it. So good. Well, speaking of the Mad Prophet, should we should we go into a little bit of the lore? Yeah, let's Please. do this. Absolutely. Be before we do, could we circle back just quickly? Will you humor me? Uh-huh. So, Absolutely. So, like, everybody kind of went on a little thing they like about Phrasma uh, <laughs> right. when we started this out. And one of the things that, that I like, because I... Apparently, I'm the the odd man out, but like I've never been particularly drawn to Phrasma. Probably the severe, you know, goth mommy aesthetic is is not more my vibe. Uh, what I do You're out of your goddamn mind, then, sir. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're different people, <laughs> but no, like what what I do like is the sort of trope of like the Grim Reaper thing, like death as a job, you know, like that that there is work that needs to be done to keep chaos from happening by managing death, right? Which is an old, old tradition. I mean, back to, everybody thinks of Hades as the, the like, death god in Greek mythology, but really the Grim Reaper was Thanatos, right? Like, his job was to, to you know, deal with, with death in a day-to-day -day basis. But then, so, like, I, I was surprised nobody brought this up. There's a book series by Piers Anthony, called The Incarnations of Immortality. Oh. And On a Pale Horse is the first book, and, and it, it actually inspired the show Dead Like Me. 
I was just going to oh. say, yeah, the Dead Like Me, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that, that yeah. book series was a loose inspiration for Dead Like Me, but it, it each book in the series basically uh, takes on the premise that each of these different aspects of the natural world, of the order of things, is a job, is a station, right? And the first book is death, and this guy was, like, going to kill himself, and the Grim Reaper showed up, and he turned his gun and shot the Grim Reaper in the head, and it's like, oop, now that's your job. <laughs> you know, so oh, you have Santa to take Claus on the them. role it's of the Santa death. Claus. It's the Santa <laughs> right, Claus. It is. Yes. And and so each book has that kind of premise of like the second one is about time. Like there's a, a god or a controller of time. And so and a, a regular person has to take over those duties, you know, and Mother Nature, but too, I believe. Right. Nature, I believe, is the third one. The War third. is one of them. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's a really interesting kooky series like the the. When he takes over the role as death, he gets his pale horse, which is a a, a stretch limousine uh, <laughs> called called something Steed. I can't remember the yeah. death Death Steed was the name of the limousine, but it can turn into an airplane or a boat. But anyways, just the aspect of like death as a profession is is always been really appealing to me. Like that notion of the Grim Reaper. Speaking of which, we talked about weather Grim Reapers. Like, they can be on the spectrum of being real cringe. My dad has a Grim Reaper tattoo on his arm. So that maybe just, like, subconsciously from childhood, that's why I haven't gravitated towards the, like, Grim Reaper aesthetic. Pathfinder also <laughs> has the bad aspect of death as well, the horseman. You can you can mm -hmm. worship Charon, mm -hmm. the horseman of mm -hmm. death, yep. which is the, the right. bad side <sighs> of death. So there's the, you know, there's always that, yeah. Yeah. that parable, I, you know? Yeah. You brought up a really interesting point, Heath, too, is that, and this is, again, uh, I'm a history nerd. I think I went into that on the last episode. You brought up you brought up Hades, and in classical Greek mythology, Hades wasn't the villain. Like, today we always think of Hades as a villain because of the Disney movie Hercules played by he's played by James Woods and he's like the bad guy of the movie but Hades isn't wasn't a villain like Hades was seen as a god to be worshipped again death is a natural thing in life and he, he wasn't ever seen as a villain I don't, I don't know that that's entirely true there are aspects of Greek mythology that villainize him what with the whole deal with Persephone, Persephone myth the, the, well, the, yeah. the stealing thereof of, of Persephone well, but even in his earliest incarnation he's viewed as like a jealous douchebag because he didn't want to be the god of the underworld and got kind of pushed into that well, because Poseidon yeah, got I mean, to see we could, we could get into all the deities in Greek mythology yeah, are, are kind of douchebags. <laughs> are, are douche all assholes. Zeus We're all douchebags. Zeus was what I'm, what I'm getting horrible. To, but what I'm getting <laughs> to get the point is that like he wasn't outright pure <laughs> evil. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All uh, that I agreed. took away from that was that there needs to be a spinoff of dubious knowledge on Greek gods now. Oh, I'll be there <laughs> every time. I'm a, I'm a sucker for Greek mythology. <laughs> yeah, I, I just mythology in general. Um, I'm there. Uh, I, I actually recently found a new Greek mythology podcast. Uh, I'll let you guys know later. Nice. <laughs> all right, all right. What do we want to... Uh, yeah, lore, that's right. Yeah, so we, we talked a little about the first part of her lore in that... She's the sole survivor of the last universe and was the first resident of the current universe. She was... And a lot of what I'm about to talk about comes out of the Windsong Testament's Three Fears of Phrasma chapter. Okay. The Windsong Testaments were a web fiction series that was done right around the launch of 2E. In each of the the Windsong Testaments installments talks about a different deity or group of deities. This and is from Paizo? This isn't like fanfic? Yeah, right? this is Paizo. Okay. Uh, published on their blog, all written by James Jacobs. Yeah, I was, I was going to say it's by JJ. But, obviously, Three Fears of Phrasma is the one that focuses on Phrasma, and it focuses on... It starts with 
how she came into being and she appears on on a stone seal floating through the maelstrom the maelstrom is pure chaos and it's the only thing that exists at this point and her first fear is taking that first step off of the seal into something new so that's one of the fears of Phrasma. But as soon as she steps off the seal, the spiral starts. And she starts walking around the seal. And around the seal. And this starts creating the great beyond. It brings into existence all the other planes alongside the maelstrom. It brings into existence Axis and Heaven and Elysium, Nirvana everywhere comes into existence because she took that first step and started walking. All the other gods come into existence because she took that first step and started walking. But at the same time that she started walking, so did yogg -Sothoth. And he started walking in the other direction because he is the other foundation of the universe. He is the other pillar of the universe. He is her opposite. He is known as the Great Watcher. And he's just opposite of her in all things. But the Windsong Testaments talks about how all the other deities came into being. And one of the things that as I was reading the Windsong Testaments again tonight that struck out to me is that when... Desna came into being right at the beginning as well. One of the first eight gods. First thing she did was throw up the first night sky. And immediately following Desna in creation was Serenray. And the, I think the Windsong Testaments is probably the first place we got reference to... Saren Ray and Desna actually being lovers because it references how it was love at first sight for Saren Ray. She fell in love with Desna immediately and in love with Desna's creations immediately so much so that she took the brightest one of those stars in the night sky and claimed it as her own. And I, I love that and it's a segue from actually talking about Phrasma, but it's part of Phrasma's myth, because she brought them all into existence together. She was there at the the, chain, the chaining of Rovagug, and helped to seal him inside Galarian. Oh, so she was hands-on at one point in time. She had to be. Yeah. It had to be in that case, because yeah. otherwise everything would get destroyed and it wasn't time for it to be destroyed yet because back then prophecy still worked right so she also she also saw the rise of Urgothoa which Urgothoa was originally a mortal woman who just decided to step out of line at the boneyard and became the first undead and claimed divinity as an undead and that's one of the the things that Phrasma will will always have hanging over her is the one time she failed to judge somebody created the thing that she despises the most. Mm hmm You know, and Inner Sea Gods talks about how even the deities that she doesn't like she still is a she still kind of gets along with because she has to because right. souls work have to go to them and one of the examples there was Urgothoa in that yeah I don't like what she does but sometimes souls are destined to go to her realm so just gotta do it That that's really gotta chap her ass though because it's like she shouldn't have a realm mm. that's my yeah, fault yeah. you know 
And then, so we talked about the first fear of Phrasma, and the, the Windsong Testaments was the three fears of Phrasma, right? So we got two more to go, get to. The second fear of Phrasma happened about a hundred years ago. Hmm. Uh, and uh, I think that that point in time will make it clear what I'm probably talking about to most of you. But for those at home who aren't as familiar with Galarian dates, uh, about a hundred years ago, uh, the god of humanity just up and died. And with him, prophecy failed. Because when he died, he was prophesized to return to Galarian and do something big. And then he just fucking didn't show up because he croaked. And that broke prophecy. And as prophecy broke, a lot of Phrasman clergy also broke. Because they lost a significant part of their goddess. Because one of her three pillars was now gone. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, the ones that, the clergy that were tied closest to prophecy actively went insane. Because yeah. now they were seeing conflicting futures and conflicting prophecies because everything was broken. And that caused Phrasma's church to to turn a kind eye to that and help those that were broken by the breaking of prophecy by treating them, giving them safe places to live and recover and get better. Lots of Phrasmin temples have wings that are dedicated to be safe asylums, and asylum in the good way, not the bad way. Asylum in the way that it's idealized, not in the way that it works in reality, right? Mm -hmm. This, and this is, this is a point I wanted to make, and you bring it up, Corey. So, and I hate to interrupt, but we had talked about last week on Lamash too, how one of the things that's I found really, really gross about that deity is if you worship Lamash too, you are not allowed to help anybody that has mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And this is the exact opposite of it. Mm -hmm. This is the exact opposite where the church of Phrasma has created this, like this almost this wing within their church where they actively go out and, and help those with mental health issues mm -hmm. where they, 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 they take them in and they, and to your point is, it's it's a, it's a it's a ward, it's an asylum, but not in like the gross way that we think about like these insane asylums. It is like a legitimate place where those with mental health issues can actually get the care that they need. Yeah, yeah. like what the word asylum actually means. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes, and once again, just just like the bring your pregnant about to give birth wife or whoever <laughs> to this gothic cathedral it's also if someone's someone needs mental help take him to this super imposing looking black terrifying building <laughs> but hey it works so that wound up being the second fear for asthma is when prophecy broke and she had no idea what is actually coming in the future and then we get to the third fear, and uh, Mike kind of touched on this one earlier, in that because prophecy is broken, she no longer sees what is going to happen at the end of the universe. For the longest time, she knew exactly how things were going to unfold, and she doesn't know that anymore. But what she does know is that she doesn't think she can be the last survivor of this universe like she was of the previous universe. And she knows that she has to be the penultimate death of the universe. She has to be the second to last to go. Because whoever is after her has to be reborn in the new universe, right? So she is 
training one of the psychopomp ushers. And I believe it's her daughter, actually, who is her youngest. Being, her youngest daughter, mm-hmm. who is being groomed into the role of next universe's goth mommy. And but that's her third fear is that because prophecy is broken, this won't actually happen the way it needs to happen, and the universe will just fucking end. And nothing will come after. Mike, you were gonna say something? Yeah, her her daughter the her the youngest of her daughters, uh Atropos, as she is called, has the title the last sister. And she's gonna she's the chosen successor to be the next incarnation of reality. She's a wolf sized Nasoy wearing a silver mask, uh, that has a long peacock tail and the eyes with, with eyes for every soul she will ever judge. Holy shit. Yeah. Weird. She doesn't have art in Concordance of Rivals. I would think that she would be one that would have art. Yeah, I would. I I thought so too, but she doesn't. She seems really looked, important. Well, I even looked at too, face. too many eyes. They couldn't fit it on the page. Is what it is. <laughs> He's got it figured out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so I did want to ask. Sorry, I don't mean to detract again, or or distract again. But so I'm not as knowledgeable about these sort of proto mythology of of Pathfinder, the like uh, origin story of of the universe and all that. So it is like canonical in Pathfinder that like there was a universe before this one that its destruction was the birth of this universe it's kind of yep. like that that yeah. aspect yeah. of multiverse theory where like the the universe collapses but then explodes again to create another universe and that's an infinite cycle yeah yep and Dope. it's it's interesting that you bring <laughs> it's interesting that you bring up the multiverse because that's kind of the vibe I got when um when I was reading the text about about how all of the prophets and all of the the followers of Phrasma who really leaned into that aspect, like they they talk about like fortune tellers and palm readers and dream readers and all these other harrowers, 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 yeah, mm-hmm. they they all these all these folks. When prophecy broke, when Aradin died, they all of a sudden started seeing all these different timelines and paths. And I really got the aspect of, um, uh, gosh, I forget what his name is, but that's the one aspect of Kang, the one aspect of Kang in the in the show Loki, where he has all those different timelines he's trying to manage, and it's just kind of driving him a little kooky. Yeah, that'll do it yeah, to it you. Would. It would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, I want Doctor Strange with that one, Jason. Seeing all the mm-hmm. all the different ways and only one works. You know, all the different right. outcomes and only one works, kind of thing. Yeah, I, I can see that. But that, those are the big points of Farazman lore. Like we said earlier, she's a lot more hands off than a lot of the deities of Galarian. So her lore just basically revolves around her place in the universe like there there's not a whole lot of like fighting other gods or anything like that it's just she helped create the universe she'll be here when it dies here are a couple of things she did along the way but mostly she's just there yeah it'd be really interesting i think the only one that would that would really Like pose a true counter to her would be Yogg-Sothoth. Mm-hmm. like literally, and that 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 pun was not intended as a <laughs> counter to her. <laughs> so yeah, b- before we get into post gap stuff, we there's a couple more things that we had to go mm-hmm. over was holidays, holidays, aphorisms, and of course, uh, Steve wouldn't let us get out of here without talking about planar allies. Oh, yeah, so, we're not getting out of here without uh, talking about Planar Allies. We got to Thank you, Steve. I was with the, I was with you on that one too because that's Good. like my yeah, big yeah, point. So that I was going to make. I want to talk about her allies, but so she uh, has for, a she has a whole month dedicated to her for Ast. Mm-hmm. Yep, and specifically the the fifth of for Ast is a little bit more holy than most of the month. It's yep. known as the Day of Bones. 
it's a really cool holiday. Like I was reading about it, and basically any any individual who has passed within a certain amount of time around the fifth of Ferast, the the clergy of Ferasma kind of keeps the keeps the corpse in gentle repose until the until the fifth of Ferast, the day of bones at which time they have this large funerary procession where they where they celebrate the passing of that soul from this realm into the into the river of souls it's it's kind of cool it has like a bit of a day of the dead vibe where they're kind of celebrating death mm-hmm. a bit so it kind of goes goes to what you're talking about Heath there's not so much like the dark the dark aspect it's kind of a little bit more celebratory Mm-hmm. I got at least I got a Day of the Dead vibe, like Dia de los Muertos vibe. The procession Certainly, well, yeah. and that, Forgotten Souls. that plays into the month that she was given when the calendar was created. Ferast would correspond with our April, and mm-hmm. the reason that Ferast is that month is to play into the other side of Ferasma. Ferast is the first month of spring. And Rebirth. is a symbol of new life emerging. So it, it ties into the birth part of Phrasma worship. Yeah. In the, they, they were straight up addressing that problem. Hey, you're a little too on the death side. Let's balance that out and give you the the bunny month, you know? You don't get to have December or November or whatever. <laughs> right. we, you gotta stay in spring. It's a PR <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, Phrasma, Phrasma said, just wake me up when September comes. All right. There we go. <laughs> but she does have an end of year celebration as well. She has the procession of unforgotten souls, which happens nightly in the weeks that lead up to the Harvest Festival. So uh, essentially a few weeks before Thanksgiving, you have a nightly ceremony to Phrasma. And that, again, ties into the other aspect of, all right, we worshipped her heavily in spring, now we're going to worship her heavily in, in the end of fall so that we we make it through the winter. It's And this, this holiday is really cool, too. The imagery behind it is something I would actually, absolutely love to see. Basically, the clergy, the the everybody at, in, during these holidays during the, during the harvest festival, they they wear these really colorful clothes, but the clergy they uh, they drape themselves in these really thin black robes, and what the what the ritual is is they carry these candles, and they walk through a body of water. Um, whether it's a river or a lake or a pond of some sort, and as they they walk, the the can the candle eventually goes out and they they submerge for a bit, and when they come out the other side, the candle relights to signify the to signify like the like the the rebirth, and the the thin black robes that they wear are wearing. Because they're wet, they become translucent, and you can see the bright Harvest Festival colors underneath. Th- that that imagery just really struck me. Yeah. It's just something really cool. And uh, so those are her major holidays and her month. Before we get into Planar Allies, uh, she does have a few aphorisms. Uh, I know one of these is very close to your heart, Steve. I live for the aphorisms, man. Ever since I I got really big into Hylax and Starfinder, I found some just perfect ones to kind of base a character around. Like, give them to me. You want to talk about her first one, Steve? Oh, would that happen to be not this year, not yet? It would. Yeah, so that is one of the (laughs) classics. I, to me, it's kind of like a, I don't know. It's, it's, like, it 
it's like a sign of the cross or something for Phrasmas, mm-hmm. although that's probably closer to just tracing the spiral over your heart. But it's it's a very typical saying of of theirs in within the faith itself. Boy, it's the, been the a Christ while. be with you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, there you go, Corey. That's it right there. <laughs> but I really like the list in general. The next one's really good too. Yeah. So, uh, so after for not that this, one though, you're not what? Sorry, I was gonna say for that one, would that be something a Farazman would say to someone else to wish them well? Or is it like a, a self like beseeching Farazma not to take it, me this year? It, it's, it's more it's of a, the latter. Yeah. It's a it's a little it's it a, can be a little bit of both. Yeah. Basically the, the, the concept behind it is to delay is the is you're beseeching the goddess to delay to delay something. It's like yeah. not this year, not yet. So something bad is gonna happen, whether to yourself or to somebody else, and you're just saying to Phrasma, hey, don't let it happen now. Not yet. The the second one that Steve was talking about there is all who live must face her judgment and this one's the threat yeah this one's the one that you say to your enemies in the yeah when you die you're still gonna face my goddess so have fun with that bud this is the like what goes around comes around karma's a bitch like type of phrase right Mm-hmm. It's like okay, you can you can screw me over on this, or you can be a dick all you want, but Phrasma's gonna get you. Yeah, T- take it up with Jesus, pal. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's Tonight the cooking we something in up. Hell. She's the cooking something up. <laughs> <laughs> then there is the lady shall keep it, which is the the secret goes with me to the grave. The only person that's going to hear this is Phrasma when she judges me. And then the last one in the list is Phrasma's Sands Keep Running. And this is the, would you hurry the fuck up? I've got places to be. Come on. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Times are moving. Yeah. So. uh, I feel like that one could also be like a this too shall pass kind of thing. You know, like, yeah. like it's bad right now, but hey, for Asma's sands keep running, like we'll get through this. Mm. Yeah. So, for Asma well, does have. Some... I wanted to, oh, I wanted to bring ahead. up something real quick. What, well, real quick? Steve, you had mentioned drawing the 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 spiral. Mm-hmm. What's really cool, and to go back to a topic that we talked about about an hour ago. Was the uh, <laughs> the different regional aspects of the religion? Depending on where you're from, th- that that spiral could be drawn differently. Like um, they some some areas draw it with their fist, others draw it with just, with their two with two fingers, their middle finger and their index finger, and crossed. Some some of them draw them crossed, like it's. It's, again, like the Catholic Church, and some people do it differently. They, you could do the sign of the cross with. I've seen it done with the thumb. I've seen it done with the index finger. I've seen it done with the middle. Like, depending on where you're from, is the cross like the the cross fingers? Is that from the TN region? Because that makes a lot of sense. Because oh. the cross fingers is a sign of protection. It's basically putting up a shield in in. Uh, the Asian mythologies and culture and in, in culture. That's one of the few things I actually know a lot about because I went to college for it. Useless degree. Fun fact is that, about is, me. Is that why hey, that's, is you're that proving why Vash, it's not useless right now. Is that why Vash the Stampede does it in Trigun? That's why Vash does it, and that's why Bartholomeo from One Piece has the shield and he can only do it when he crosses his fingers because that's basically it. Yeah. Interesting. I learned something today. Yeah, that's pretty dope. Yeah, useless degree, my ass. <laughs> I want to say, I I want to say the crossed fingers was actually Osirian and Galarian lore. Okay, okay. But uh, so, uh, Phrasma does have some pretty sweet planar allies. Um, she is actually one of the gods that is closest tied to her planar allies. In that, 
an entire subset of planar planar being is under her wing. But first, let's talk about the specific ones, and then we can talk about the broader planar allies of her. She has three very specific ones that come up a lot. Uh, one is Bird Than Sorrow. Bird Than Sorrow is a a Linorm who can channel positive energy like a cleric and just hates the undead. So she's just this big worm-like dragon who just fucking hates the undead and goes to town on them. Can I take the next one, Corey? Can I take that one? Yeah, go the, ahead the, and take the next m- one. My favorite one The next one, one is, is great. I think Steve will love the next one if yeah. you didn't read it already. It's Echo oh, of I'm, Lost Divinity. I'm well aware. The Echo of Lost Divinity, which is <laughs> a spectral it. warrior that's dressed as an Aslanti that kind of looks a lot like Aradin and only came to Phrasma's side at the beginning of the Age of Lost Omens, which is when Aradin died. But, you know, it could just yeah. be a, a, a free coincidence. You know, Aradin could have a twin. He denies Aradin. that he's Aradin, but, you know, you, know, you not look Aradin. like him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Aradin light, but, I guess, would be the best way to put it, right? Suspicious <laughs> timing, to be sure. Mm-hmm. I, right. can, I can tell I'm the primary Starfinder player here because as soon as you said the as, said Aslanti, with without meaning to, my brow furrowed in my yeah. mouth. Mm. I saw it. I saw it. Don't, you don't green, like Aslanti. <laughs> you thought green armor, all kinds of bad stuff. I get it. And, and then her herald is the steward of the sky, and the steward of the sky is a. A mighty warrior dressed in, like, head-to-toe plate mail with white wings, and yet even though she's wearing this heavy plate, she only weighs about 200 pounds. And she... She oversees the balance of fate and, uh... appears at... as an incorporeal shade, often making pronouncements and then fading away... And just kind of, kind of is the more hands-on part of Phrasma, since Phrasma can't be as hands-on as a lot of other deities. Her herald is a little bit more hands-on. She's also being asked to join Milani's herald in taking care of the final blades of Galt, because those take your soul and stop your your your. Well, stop you from going forward. We we can talk about this in the spoiler corner. That's been taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> that was just something I, I I found cool. And then of course, she has all the psycho pumps, and I well, think this is what Steve second, really Corey. wanted to talk about. Of of course, I want to talk about this, but I can't believe you're gonna do my boy endless gravestone dirty like this. Yeah, I- uh, he wasn't in Inner Sea Gods. Where is Endless Gravestone from? I, this this right here says that he's in Gods and Magic, page 30 and 31. <laughs> Endless Gravestone. This servant appears to be an animated, wheel-like being composed of rock. That's it. Not referenced mm-hmm. one other place. That's all the text he got. Just a big old gravestone. <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, that must be uh, Pathfinder Chronicles Gods and Magic uh, <laughs> Maybe. from 2009, which I typically don't look at that one because it mostly got reprinted in Inner Sea Gods. That's probably true, and that's, that's probably good. why that's... No- nothing exists about <laughs> this thing, because they're probably like, this is dumb. Look, that's for Asma's <laughs> Pokemon, okay? Yep. I'm sorry, I just saw Endless Gravestone and was like, I gotta yep. talk about that. Phrasma <laughs> is pages 30 and 31 of the original Gods and Magic from 2009. There you go. Alright, now we can talk about Psycho Pop. Sorry, I had to give my boy <laughs> his due credit. I do want to say her herald is metal as, fa- is metal as fuck. Like, mm-hmm. she, it, it's, she looks incredible. It's not in, so, it's not in the chat. 
psychopomps are the ushers of the dead. In fact, the the uh, the divinity form of the psychopomp is the psychopomp usher, because you know all of all of the outsiders have their their one step from true divinity form. Angels and all of the good aligned planar beings all have imperial lords, demons have demon lords, devils have the archdukes, psychopomps have psychopomp ushers, which are they are one step below actual deities, but they still give spells, they still they still have followers. They still have their own edicts and anathemas. Uh, we talked about one of the psychopomp ushers earlier um, because she is Phrasma's daughter. There are a bunch of them for different psychopomp casts. And there are a bunch of different psychopomp casts. Uh, my favorite is the No Soy. Thanks in large part to, I think, the thing that probably makes... Uh, them one of Steve's favorites as well. Cute but, as hell? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I was thinking of a specific one. Oh, well, yes. I know I know <laughs> who you, whom you were referring to. Big, big part of that. No soy are my favorite Pathfinder creature. That's that's out of all of them. I, I think they're fascinating. I love them. They're little birds. Just like the the spiral over the chest they're super regionalized so they're well they're where they're oh they're, can't talk today long day guys <laughs> they will wear different types of masks or different styles of masks based on what region of the world they pop up in which i love all the artwork super cute of them there's uh, again this could be spoiler territory so i'm not mentioning anything but I was flipping through a um, one of the adventure paths and saw an, an NPC that was in a no soy, and he was supposed to be a little guy that was writing stuff down. And he had a big old quill, and he was having trouble standing up because he's trying to stand on one foot and then write with the other with this quill. It was great. I just like <laughs> looking at him. Yeah, we didn't we didn't go over this in the earlier section, but the one of Phrasma's like signs is whippoorwills, the bird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the Nosois tend to be whippoorwills. Not always, but they generally <laughs> tend to be whippoorwills. Yeah. And then you have other psychopomps as well. You've got you've got the Marignas and the Katrinas. Uh, the Katrinas are your your day of the dead sugar skull faced Mm -hmm. uh, psychopomps. The marignas are spidery women with long flowing gowns. But really, all of the psychopomps exist for one reason, and that is to to guide the dead to whatever comes next. Right? Uh, so, as we alluded to earlier, the uh, the Phrasma takes the big cases for judgment but her psychopomps and her psychopomp ushers take the smaller cases and they're the ones that will judge most people I think it should be said that there's also a psychopomp focused prestige class in 1A called the Mortal Usher, which gives mm -hmm. you a psychopomp mask that you can put on your face, which is, you know, just everybody, every edgelord's dream, really, you know. And then you get and different powers based off of different psychopomps as the level goes on. And there is a psychopomp versatile heritage mm -hmm. in second edition. Mm -hmm. From mm -hmm. Dustwalker? Yeah, Dustwalker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're great. I love psychopomps in general. I think they're all super unique. I love that they have like a little cast system. So when you die and if you worship Phrasma or you just are a neutral person and you become a, 
a uh, Petitioner. Uh, a psychopomp, and then you just kind of work your way up. You might start as a no, no soy, and then you might be an isobach after that, and work your way up. I think they they maintain parts of their personality from before they died, so they're all a little unique, which makes them fun NPCs. And I don't know, the the creature designs are just super cool. I like that they all follow Phrasma's edicts, but all kind of disagree on exactly how they should carry them out. So they always argue. I don't know. I, I like them a lot. They're my, they're my favorite. Well, ain't that I, I, just religion? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will. I, I like psychopomps in general more than like demons or devils or angels or whatever big lump you want to put other creatures into. I think psychopomps are the best. There's also the shakal that are the inverse of the psychopomps. Yeah. As well. The sekil. Sekil. Sorry, I, I I'm Philly trash. I talk weird. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Like, I, I say things weird. Sorry. They, they are fantasy words. Everyone has their own pronunciations. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But yeah, they're yeah, they're gnarly. Yeah, S- the, the Zach on STF recently went on a tirade about how to pronounce fantasy words. But yeah, I I really do like psychopomps. I I like their lore as well, Steve. Like they're they're just they're nifty, and the Nansoi are just gosh darn cute. Hell yeah! All the other ones well, less so. Well, speaking of gosh darn cute, it's time for it's time for some the post gap corner with Heath. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, before we get there, uh, I'm back on the show, so I've got to bring bring back a fan favorite segment. Yes. So I wanted to give Jason four ways that Phrasma is like the Green Bay Packers. My God. <laughs> so, number one, I really went in on this one. Since the beginning of time, Phrasma has sat on her throne in the boneyard, impartially judging the souls of every dead mortal and sending it to its final rest. Also, since the beginning of time by modern football standards, the Packers' legacy has loomed large. They won the first two Super Bowls, and the soul of famed Packers coach Vince Lombardi lives on within the NFL Super Bowl trophy, impartially judging all who came after him. (laughs) True. True. All right. That was nicer than I expected, Heath. He's got three more. Yeah. He's got three more. We got time. We got time. (laughs) <clears throat> Look, the sands of Phrasma go on or whatever. <laughs> uh, number two, Phrasma's domain is the boneyard, sometimes referred to as purgatory. No matter how hard a person tries, the river of souls will eventually bring their soul to Phrasma's vast necropolis. Similarly, the Green Bay Packers are based out of the wasteland called Green Bay, Wisconsin. No matter how much they hope to avoid it, each year a new crop of players are drafted by the Packers to suffer through their formative years in this icy hellscape. There we go. Also true. Also true. (laughs) Yep. It's not called the frozen tundra for nothing. Yep, that's true. Uh, Number three, as the goddess overseeing the natural cycle of life and death, Phrasma's most notable trait is being impartial. Thus, she can come across as cold and stern. The Green Bay Packers organization is similarly impartial, seeming not to care about their players' wants, refusing to help them change their fate by drafting more than one good wide receiver at a time. (laughs) And number four, Phrasma is both the goddess of birth and death, the beginning and the end. While she is responsible for the birth of new humans, she is also responsible for their deaths and souls, and will not be robbed of a life owed to her. The Green Bay Packers also take on this role, historically developing quarterbacks and helping them grow from rookies to Hall of Famers before unceremoniously ending their tenure with the team by trading them away. So, to the Most Jets. of the time to go. the Jets. <laughs> My, he, yeah, he generally to funny. the Jets. <laughs> uh, it's just That's a fun good. little project to give Jason shit, which is just, <laughs> I'm a fan of projects and giving Jason shit. Uh, I, I'm football. sad that we didn't have a Lamash do one. Yeah, you messaged me, but it was a little bit too late. I was like, oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. That yeah. one's tough. You got to really yeah, lean into tough. some yeah. evil shit, you know? Yeah. All right. So post-gap corner yeah. with Heath. Yeah, so what I'm actually here for. 
<laughs> we we already mentioned uh, the I, I showed you guys the art from Starfinder of Phrasma, and, and you brought up that it, it much more favors the mad profit aspect of uh, Phrasma in, in Pathfinder terms, which I do think it's interesting. I was thinking about as we went through this, there's the whole death of Aridin thing, and therefore the death of prophecy is kind of a, a really big deal in, in Pathfinder and their current lore. However, that that seems to not really matter in Starfinder. Either it's been long enough or uh, Aridin was part of Galarian and Galarian has disappeared in the Starfinder lore. So the Lady of Graves, Phrasma, is listed in Starfinder as the goddess of birth, death, fate, and prophecy. So pro- prophecy is still fair game, right? There is an alternative theme knowledge that you can take, uh, I guess, as a follower of Phrasma, where you can reduce the DCs of culture checks to recall knowledge about a society's funeral rites or beliefs concerning death by five, uh, and reduce the DCs of mysticism checks to identify undead creatures by five. So you can get some mechanical benefits. Oh, that's cool. As alternate theme knowledge. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I do think it's funny. So, So her... Favorite weapon is is a dagger. It's just a dagger in Pathfinder. Yeah, mm-hmm. just a dagger. Okay, it, in Starfinder, it is a zero knife, which is still a type of dagger, although it's a switchblade dagger. But it is also a cryo switchblade, so <laughs> it's straight up like an ice switchblade. Um, well, hey, she had cool. those domains in first edition or whatever. It's like water and ice or whatever. So yeah, they're sure. trying to pay that off in some small way in, in Starfinder. <laughs> But yeah, so the zero knife, you, you can you can look it up. You can take zero knives in Starfinder. They're really neat. Uh, so edicts and anathema, we still have those in Starfinder. Uh, the edicts are guard the sanctity of life, life and death, lay bodies to rest, honor the weave of fate, and destroy undead and those who would create them. Uh, and I've, I've noticed there's a lot of... Uh, again, you guys are more the, the Phrasma people in Pathfinder than I am, but there seems to be a lot of emphasis on fate you know, in, in the Starfinder version. Because anathema are create undead, desecrate corpses, and attempt to reverse or change your fate. That one is the real bugaboo to me, because it's like, if someone tries to shoot me in the face, am I not supposed to try to prevent that? Like, is that my fate? To be shot in the face? No, I think it's more like uh, <laughs> lichdom. Or, you know, trying to find a way to circumvent death entirely. Whether, uh, you know, be, be, I guess it's really hard because I just the don't oxygen, like the right? incredibly vague phrasing of it. Mm-hmm. You know, the like attempt to reverse or change your fate in any way is like, that's a broad, broad spectrum. You yeah, know, I, like, I think you guys are both absolutely right on this, Mike. I think your interpretation <laughs> is correct, but. Heath, to your point, there's mm-hmm. there's so much room there for like, okay, so what does changing your fate actually mean? Like, right, com- completely vague. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I just don't like the vagueness of it. I get the spirit of it, I guess. So you can get blessings and curses in in Starfinder uh, if you incorporate those into your game. Uh, for blessings, uh, you see a glimpse of the future in a vital moment. So prophecy still on the board, like I said. Your weapons are particularly effective against undead, or the strands of fate are tweaked in your favor. Once again, really vague on that third one, you know? <laughs> Which that 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 obviously up to a GM's interpretation. That gives yeah. a GM the the fiat option of like, oh well, I'll I'll let you re-roll this or whatever because Phrasma's got your back, right? Curses are you receive horrifying visions of the future. Again, prophecy's still alive. Or is alive again, rather. Divinations concerning you contain dire cryptic portents, or your life and lineage lineage abruptly end before their time. So you just die, and so does your entire line, is one of the curses. That, that's nice. the same. That's the same major curse in Second Edition. Yeah, mm-hmm. really. Is, is that yeah? Your you and your li- your entire lineage end. And um, it's like so, you couldn't just have made it me. Like my kids got to die too. Jeez. Yeah, and and to top it off, mechanically, 
until you die, you're permanently doomed to in mm-hmm. second edition. Jesus. Oh, God. Yeah. Permanently the, doomed to. What does the doomed status do? I mean, I can infer, but like, what does it, it takes mechanically you straight do? Takes to that dying value yeah. if yep. you enter dying. Yeah, so, yeah. If you go oh, unconscious, it, you, you're right to dying too. Immediately. Oh, okay. okay. So basically, That's basically a crit. Right to dying three. Mm-hmm. Basically, a, cr- a critic. Two. Yeah, a critical hit basically kills you. If yep. a critical oh. hit knocks you unconscious, you're dead. Uh, so it doesn't take you to that value. It adds that value to your already, yes. Yes. your current value. Oh, that's brutal. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't piss off Phrasma in 2E, I guess. That's rough. <laughs> so uh, the, I already actually read part of the uh, this this next paragraph as part of my first why Phrasma is like the Green Bay Packers. But it says, since the beginning of time, Phrasma has sat on her throne in the boneyard, impartially judging the soul of every dead mortal and sending it to its final rest. It's said that Phrasma is with every living being in the universe from birth to death, even the gods, and she knows all the choices they'll face and the consequences they will engender. We get to the worshippers part, and it's funny, like, I, I thought it was interesting, the you know, the list of types of worshippers that they had. They did expand it a little bit in Starfinder. <laughs> I'll have you know. Phrasma's faithful claim that everyone prays to the Lady of Graves at some point in their lives, which I love that sentence because it's kind of like there's no non Phrasmans in a foxhole kind of thing. <laughs> like, if if you're about to die, like, you'll probably take a shot on, on you know, giving a little prayer to Phrasma. Phrasmans come from all walks of life. Diviners and doctors, midwives and morticians, healers and undead slayers. So they really added in the undead slayers for it. Even those who don't venerate Phrasma as their primary patron deity tend to offer prayers when they fear death approaching and expectant parents also beseech Phrasma for her blessings during childbirth. So pretty standard there. It gets really interesting when we get to talk about undeath in Starfinder, though. Undeath is not a disqualifier for the rights of personhood or citizenship under Pact World's law, and many consider the Church's stance on the undead outdated or even offensive. Phrasma's views on the undead are unchanged, but her Church is subject to mortal laws and has updated its public stance to focus on other aspects of the faith instead. So they've kind of like... (laughs) As a PR move, they've scaled back from the hating undead thing, except that they totally still hire undead slayers all the time. Fuck you, just Yox. Like, it's just like the Catholic Church. I was about to say, it's just like the there Catholic Church. There you go. The Inquisition didn't happen. <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, I, I thought that was really interesting that, like, of course, Starfinder has to consider the PR implications, you know? Right, right. This conflict, excuse me, this conflict between divine dogma and church doctrine led to a schism when the Absalom Pact was signed. A sect of religious extremists seeks the destruction of all undead and has been implicated in several terrorist attacks that targeted undead citizens. Rumors say they seek nothing less than the complete purging of all undead on Eox. So there's a split in the church and there's a radical faction that they're like, screw that they saw that the the church of phrasma was scaling back the undead hate and said nope we're gonna go the other way and we're gonna have a crusade against the undead so there's kind of two branches of the phrasman church now in starfinder <clears throat> in terms of sacred sites obviously cemeteries mortuaries catacombs uh any kind of sites for remembrance honoring the dead they're all sacred as are locations dedicated to birth Uh, Phrasma's holy symbol frequently decorates the walls of maternity wards. Again, standard stuff. One of the greatest churches of Phrasma is the Spiral Basilica on Eox, a spiritual bastion for the faithful forced to travel to the planet of the undead. While not as extravagant, the halls of memory on Absalom Station still maintain the gothic sensibilities of Phrasma's faith and serve as the station's largest funeral home. Uh, In recent years, Phrasmids flocked to Aposte after a vault was discovered beneath the planetoid surface bearing Phrasma's spiral and esoteric prophetic writing on its walls, floors, and ceilings. This influx has led to growing interest in the faith among the many of Aposte's disenfranchised uh, residents, seeing in Phrasma's impartiality an equalizing force in a world stacked against them. That's really cool. 
Was yeah. that? I wonder. I wonder if that happened in like an AP or a module or something where they found that vault of Phrasma underneath Absalom. Sounds I, like a Starfinder I, Society thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe Thanks. maybe that because I know that's not part of an, an AP or as far as I know it's not. Yeah, uh, you're right. There just hasn't been do- much done in APs on a post day. You know. Yeah, you're right. That does sound. That does sound like a, a Pathfinder or a Starfinder Society stuff. Uh, story. Heath, Heath is, is the radical faction called the Voices of the Spire? Because that's actually a thing for, from Pathfinder. It, it's a rad, mm-hmm. it's a militarized faction of Phrasmid worshippers that specialize in the eradication of the undead. They're called the Voices of the it does, Spire. It doesn't actually say. It just says okay. a sect of religious extremists. So you that, again, that may be something that is dealt with in a, a, a Starfinder society mm-hmm. uh, situation. Uh, I'm not sure. It doesn't. It doesn't name them. Yeah. Uh, and then the last section is resources. So the Church of Phrasma always has specialized in undead fighting. They have special equipment available to members of the faith willing to hunt undead creatures that Pact World governments have sanctioned for destruction. So that so they will hunt undead when the Pact World allows them to do so. Right? <clears throat> is is an interesting thing there. For a modest donation, most churches are also willing to provide healing or divination ser- service, uh, services to worshippers and outsiders alike. Many Phrasmans also work in healthcare, frequently operating practices specializing in either the beginning or end of life. Some run free reproductive health clinics in areas where the population lacks access to such care. Others run hospice centers where patients can pass away with dignity. So the total opposite of Lamash too. <laughs> Basically, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. But right. yeah, so that's 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 pretty much the whole section uh, on on Phrasma. But I do like the added implications of like where Phrasma worship locations have popped up, and for different reasons that are kind of unexpected. Um, right. And then, uh, and then having sort of a schism in the church based on the undead I thought was a, a really notable thing because like I mean look at if we're talking about the Catholic Church look at the history of schisms in the church based on belief like right. that, that has you know very easy real world parallels parallels yeah for sure I and it really it, it really interests me too with the fact that um, she's still so into fate and prophecy even the yeah, well, even post gap. So the, well, the cool thing about the gap is it's this. It is a gap. It's this missing chunk of knowledge and time and technology and all this stuff. So that kind of is like whereas Phrasma fosters mystery inherently just by the nature of who she is, right? Adding the gap onto that, I think, is another awesome source of mystery because especially now that we know, like, oh, Aaron and dying took away prophecy, but now. Thou- presumably thousands of years later in Starfinder, whatever it was that caused Galarian to disappear and be replaced with uh, Absalom Station, prophecy's back, right? The power of prophecy exists and is and is a force at work in the Starfinder universe. Right. And it's... it, And she's still around. So the universe is still... Like, her plan for secession must still be going on or she had to scrap the plan she probably has some she's probably so tired <laughs> she, yeah. she's she's right. probably like, her hair looks the way it does Galarian imagine having to judge like everybody's bullshit for all of eternity mm-hmm. you have to hear well, so, so much nonsense yeah well, I'd, so be little, one of the I'd be imp- a little uh, be sick of it too one of the implications I like so much about the Starfinder universe uh, involving uh, Phrasma is it, it. I feel like even though, you know, playing Pathfinder, we're smart enough to assume there's probably other planets and stuff out there. But like you get involved in the, the nations of Galarian and that planet so much, you just kind of think of the game existing on that planet. You know, there are APs uh, that uh, go to other planets. I'm, I'm well aware. But like outside of that AP it's easy to kind of get in just Galarian mode, you know, like yeah. the, the world, my game world is this one planet and Starfinder is the exact opposite. So like you're forced to think about like, Oh God, it's not just having to judge everybody on Galarian, which already is a monumental task. But uh, if we know anything about Starfinder, it's infinite. 
I mean, it's mm-hmm. just an infinite number of worlds. So, like, yeah, she's tired. <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> oh, her job just got infinitely worse. Infinitely harder. Right. Like, like, oh, so now there's, and, there, there's you know, Lashuta and, and all that. it's not just hers. Too. It's not just hers. Mm-mm. It's all the psychopomp courts underneath her, too. Yeah, they're having just as bad of a time. Oh, sure. For sure. <laughs> well, like Keith said, though, like, we don't think about it because we just play on Galarian, but in, Gl- in Pathfinder, there's still the other planets of Galarian's solar system, several of them that have life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even back then, she was in charge of all of them as yeah. well. It's just we don't think about it. Right. right. That, that was more my point. Yeah. Right. That was more my point. Not that she wasn't doing that work, but that playing Starfinder, you you can't escape the fact that it's like, oh, it's all these planets and systems and and different you know parts of the galaxy. Not to mention, like we're talking about, uh, like you know, you have the Pact Worlds and Near Space and the Viscarium, but that's all in one galaxy. You know, like. It's called near space because it's kind of nebulous and it's just, uh, you know, a week or two of drift travel to get to that place, which is a, a monumental amount of distance. And all of that is still happening just in one galaxy. Mm-hmm. Like if it's mm-hmm. all of the universe, God, it's just staggering the amount of life that's <laughs> going to be out there in a Starfinder based universe. Yeah. Well, thank you for Starfinder Corner. Yes, sir. Yeah. Or not? Well, I just say yes, sir, all the time when I get <laughs> when I get commended for things. I also but really yeah. like her holy symbol in Starfinder. It's all digitized and pixely. Her her holy symbol? Mm. Yeah, the spiral. Yeah, I like her chair. Her throne <laughs> is like floating and very technological. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's Professor yeah. X's wheelchair. It yeah, kind her. of is Professor X's. Yeah. Her her aesthetic in in Starfinder gives me, really gives me like Morpheus from the Sandman vibes. Yeah, yeah, it does kind of. So, well, anything anything else before we get to spoiler corner? Anybody else wanted to bring anything up? I don't know. We've covered a lot. Yeah. yeah, we've covered a lot, but it's been good stuff. Like, there's nothing about Phrasma and the people that work under her and stuff that I don't like. This is all fascinating to me. Oh, there's there's one thing I wanted to bring up because you, you mentioned the Mwangi Mo- Expanse. There is a green dragon that is a worshiper of Phrasma that's uh, Holy uh, Zatrambia. I know where that's from. Yep, Holy yeah. Zatramba. Holy Zatramba. I'm actually running that adventure right yeah. now. Okay, so which Olo, one? Olohimba. Uh, Olohimba. It's it's from the Slithering. However, it's just a cast off little side note that is not a mechanical part of the Slithering. Mm-hmm. That okay. it, obviously it's there as a little nugget that you could expand on if you wanted to, you know. Okay. And I oh. will be just so you know. <laughs> Listen, I'm a dragon. I'm a, I play a dragon. I love dragons. Anytime there's a dragon, I'm like. Yes, give me more of that because I know uh, one of the one of the APs has a big like. Up, obviously, Age of Ashes probably has a lot of dragons in it because you know. Mm-hmm. But I think first edition, what is it? Wrath of the Righteous is is like there's a big dragon. No, I mean there are dragons in Wrath, but that's not the point of Wrath. No, not sorry, not the point. It, they're mentioned a lot more because you know, I mean, every, not really. I think, really. I, I thought I, saw, no. I thought I saw something like there was a dragon goddess or something, maybe. No? I, Not. Well, there's, but, there's a lot of APs that I haven't read. I apologize. <laughs> so, Yeah. Well, we're going to get into Spoiler Corner. So if you don't want to hear Spoiler Corner, um, we're going to do our sign-offs now. But if you want to hear, stick around till after the sign-offs. So real quick... Before we do the sign-offs, one note. Next episode, we are bringing the CEO of the (laughs) HLP, the Hideous Laughter Podcast, Griffin Norman, will be joining us to talk about Zan Kuthan. 
Have fun with that, that one. That one's going to be a good K. time. Yeah. So the head of HR joined us this time. <laughs> this is true. And, and Ethics the CEO. And compliance. HR Ethics wraps and compliance up, committee. Yes. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I, I, I still haven't found out if Emily's gotten admonished for some of the ethical in, in, incidents with regards to the HLP drinking game. So Look, we'll man, see. I'm, I'm buried under paperwork. I, I'm getting to it, all right? <laughs> I, think, I think I would be the one who gets hit with the most hits because I believe my drink, the Baja Blast drink, was the first, the, the last drink you did before the pandemic hit. So it was basically like the <laughs> death whistle for everyone. And I felt like, oh, God. I felt like shit. I was like, that can't be possible. And then like, I listened again. I'm like, totally possible. Like literally right then, like you guys were like, Baja Blast. Thanks, Buster. And you drank it and was like, we had to look, you know, different places. And all of a sudden it was like, there's a pandemic and I'm sitting here like, oh God, I'm the, I'm the usher. Oh, I'm the herald of Destro. Oh no, uh, it's my fault. You're not grandma's <laughs> ashtray though. Oh yeah, no. We, I don't think don't Alex worry. will We've ever live worse. that one down. No. No. Done way worse. No, no. <laughs> the, the Baja Blast drink well, was is fantastic, but yes, yeah, it was the precursor <laughs> well, to the pandemic. Well, um, so join us next next month for Zonkuthan with Griffin Norman. But um, Steve, where can we find you? Yeah, sure. So I am a player most of the time on any of the Hideous Laughter production shows. I think I'm on all of them. But if you guys are curious about what we do, you can check us at pretty much any podcast app ever. Hideous Laughter Podcast. Um, on that feed, what you're going to find is our first edition show where we are running through Carrying Crown. And we're almost done with it. I think we have 10-ish episodes to go. So God. it's very exciting. We're wrapping that up shortly. But also on that feed, there is a a show called the zone of truth, which I host, which is in many ways, very similar to this. It's a little bit of behind the scenes. It's a little bit about uh, learning lore and about different monsters and that kind of stuff. So that's a whole blast. If you want to check that out, that's where you can find it. We also have a show on its own Patreon feed. And I think this might be a little bit more copacetic with the 25 North listeners, because you guys are two E. Um, well, we also have a two E show called Bestow Curse. That is a two E conversion of the classic Pathfinder Adventure Path, Curse of the Crimson Throne. Uh, transparently, transparently, it's one of my favorite things I've ever done. It's so much fun. I get to play a healer mm -hmm. on that and hide in the back and just pump hit points into the party and having a fucking blast doing it. Um, the very, very last thing that I want to mention is that we have a Patreon as well. You can check us out there and find all sorts of cool rewards. But namely, we just wrapped up on our Patreon feed a run of the Malevolence module. So that's 2E. That is a haunted house story. But there is so, so, so much lore in there that is not just haunted house stuff. It's probably just worth a read if you don't want to listen to the adventure. Yeah. It's so cool. There's so much stuff in there, but we did have a lot of fun with it. So I would encourage people to check it out. We just recorded the next thing that's going to debut on that feed. It's a show called Speak with Plants. That is a Pathfinder 2E conversion of the Iron Fang Invasion AP. And the gimmick that we're doing is the party is all plant creatures. So Leshies and Gorons, come check it out. It's a blast. We got a few episodes in the tank. That's going to be dropping. Oh boy. Two weeks from today as of recording. So that will be the yeah. 16th of May. Yeah. And I think that's everything. That's a long list. Malevolence dropped today as of recording. So congratulations right. on finishing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, well, I was going to make some comments about the finale, but I can't do that because I'll spoil it for a lot of people, so I won't. And we're not in spoiler country yet. <laughs> as someone who finished Malevolence as well, as a player, it's one of my favorite one of my favorite yeah. game, like modules I've ever played. It's I, cool I, as hell. I GM'd. I GM'd you GM'd through Malevolence. You did. you did. I also GM'd Malevolence, so... My <laughs> I think you, I think you GM'd my favorite. Have... Played it. Yeah. You all forgot it in the gap, but I also GM'd all of you through Malevolence. Oh, all right. <laughs> Damn. Nice. Which <laughs> right. is quite a coincidence. <laughs> Speaking of, Heath, where can we find you? 
Yeah, uh, I am Heath uh, Parker. I'm from the STF Network or uh, Strange Table Fellows. You can find us at STF Network on Twitter, Instagram, your favorite podcatcher, or the stfnetwork.com uh, if you want to learn more about us. Our main show is the APA, which stands for Apollo Protection Agency. It's an arc where we did three three book APs in Starfinder, and we're still we're on the last of those three uh, APs currently. Uh, we also have a show called Live and Let Fly, where we're doing the uh, Fly Free or Die adventure path, which has been a lot of fun. Not only am I a player in those shows, I'm also an aspiring GM for the network, and currently. On our Twitch show, uh, STF and Friends, I am GMing the Skitter Saga. So I'm doing the first three uh, Skittermander-based uh, one-shots that, that come out have come out for uh, Free RPG Day from Paizo. So I've got a, a wonderful crew do, uh, all playing adorable little six-armed six furballs, which are Skittermanders, uh, and doing three one-shots that each are going to be two or three episodes long because... <laughs> Brevity is not my middle name. <laughs> and yeah, thanks, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's it's a great show, and if the first episode's anything, any precursor to the rest of the episodes, there's going to be a whole lot of natural twenties and a whole lot of skitter facts along the way. I love me yep, some skitter we, facts. We, 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 we are doing skitter facts, so if you want to learn more about skittermanders, if you don't know what a skittermander is because you just play Pathfinder. Come check out uh, STF and friends on Twitch uh, uh, on Mondays. It's usually like every other Monday, but but you can yeah. find us STF Network on Twitch. Mike, brother. Uh, hey everybody, it's me, Mike, or Buster Knuckle on every single Discord channel that I'm ever on. Uh, I'm also the voice of Admiral at this moment in time, Lupus Gallo, and uh, I uh, pretty much that's it. And this show, which I'm super stoked about, and I love. I can't wait for Zan Kuthan talk next time we get together, which I think uh, next week, maybe. I don't know. Behind the scenes. <laughs> behind the scenes talk. Yeah, I think it's next we're week. We're recording a bunch of these back to back because yeah. yeah. we've got summer vacations coming up. Yeah. So. And, yep. and the Desna episode, it was all a dream. It was all a we'll dream. Get it back was all to it. a dream. We'll get thank back you, to it. Thank you, thank you, Jason. I appreciate you picked that yeah. up. But yeah, yeah. Check, out, check out Steve. Check out Heath. I love all their shows. Titanium Mike, the toughest goddamn Vesk. <laughs> Matumbe. Anyone's the only... ever seen. Get yeah, it right. <laughs> that's true. I'm sorry. Say it all at once or not at all, like a pimp named Slick back or a tribe called Quest. And, exactly. And and there is a possibly an unknown secret show where they both play the same at the same table. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. interesting. Yep. All oh, things yeah. are possible in a multiverse oh, yeah, created and ushered over by Verasma. So. Real about that. <laughs> And, and Steve, for I guess the next ten episodes, being Matumbe, bringing shovels to fights, like a, the, you know, and books, the, 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 and books. Yeah. fighting with shovels and books. Yeah, hey man, that's how that's we what get you done. Do. That's how we fight. That's how we fight over here. I guess uh, mm-hmm. that's it for me. All right, Corey. Yeah, uh, you you can you can hear me occasionally on the Twenty Five North podcast as Besmara. You can also uh, hear me also occasionally on the 25 North feed on 50 North as the wonderful G-Wow. And then uh, you can also see me on True Crit on the Drunken Geek Pod Twitch. Uh, Every other Saturday, I play the Gripply inventor Tapool, who is basically Green Arrow, but a frog. And she's delightful, and I have a blast playing her. Um, and uh, that that's where you can find me in the tabletop sphere. Yeah. And in the comic sphere, women write about comics and comics beat. Yes, yes. Yes, in the comic got it. Sphere, <laughs> uh, women write about comics. Uh three-time Eisner winners going for our fourth, hopefully, this year. <laughs> yeah, d- get it. Nice. And you all know me. You all know me, so. All right, spoiler corner. It's your buddy, GM Jason. There, I said it for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, spoiler corner, we we kind of mentioned uh, at the top of the show that Phrasma doesn't really 
get hands on, so she's not super like omnipresent in any of the modules or APs a whole lot. But there are a couple that were at least she's a bit more tangentially involved than others. And I want to give the space to Mike because um, you're about you're almost done with Tyrant's Grasp, and you had mentioned that yeah. for for at least one book, she's yeah a bit more bit more present than others. Yeah, we're about to start uh, book six of Tyrant's Grasp now. Uh, actually, Steve, you know one of my players, Eric Ten. Yeah, he's one of my best buds. Good yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's. <laughs> He's in there, uh, one of my groomsmen, by fact. But yeah, book one of Tyrant's Grass, spoiler, spoiler, you're in spoiler corner, I don't know why I'm saying it, uh, takes place in the Boneyard. What? You don't know about it until you leave the crypt. And then the first thing you see is Grotus. And there's only one place that Grotus is there, is, is mm-hmm. and you can see him, uh, and that's in the Boneyard. And then you can Another actually... Motherfucker be looming. Yeah, and you can actually... But if you look around, I had my players looked around, and you could see Phrasma Spire in the very, very distance. And it's, I, I played it that it's always the same distance away, regardless of which direction you walk. It's always there, uh, which is always fun. And the uh, there's a lot of psychopomps in there. You fight a lot of Sobex. You fight, you actually befriend a Nasoy and a Van, a Banath, a Vanath. Van, the skull, yeah. Vance, the skull boys with the, the, uh, the Reaper. Umbral and Toot, right? <clears throat> yes, Umbral and Toot. And the big boss is a uh, crazed Katrina psychopomp, mm-hmm. the Sugar Skull. Yeah. Yep. And uh, basically, I don't want to spoil what happens, but there's extenuating circumstances because the living is aren't allowed in the like in the boneyard, and the PCs are technically living. So you know, it's kind of like the they they yeah. mobilize the psychopomps as like uh, trash men. But, Trash people, basically. Like, get them out. Also, fun fact, you get to meet Barzak the Passage, one of the 15 more, uh, one of the 15 Psychopomp Ushers, because there was 16, but now one is a Queen of Hell. I told you, man, this is one one thing I do have, is I have a knowledge of everything from Tyrant's Graph that I just dumped in my head. So if we talk <laughs> about T- Aridin or we talk about T- uh, Tarbafan, I'm there. Everything else, I'm just kind of like color oh. commentary, which is fun because Corey is well, so we'll, good. We'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about Aridin at some point. We'll I'm talk sure. about Aridin at I'm some sure. point. <clears throat> no, one of the one of the men, things I want to say too was we didn't really get into a, a whole lot, but there is uh, there is an evil deity that feeds upon souls from the river of souls. So it's tangentially related to tangentially related to Phrasma, who plays a huge role in abomination vaults. And there was a, there was a, a name drop mention of her in redshift rally as well. And that's nimble off. Wow. So I don't know if you want to go into that at all. I know Heath and I are both playing, so maybe maybe don't spoil the end of uh, Abomination Vaults, but um, at least book one is fine. Yeah, like it, it, it's very much. There's a lot of undead in Abomination Vaults, and a lot of worship of. Nimbaloth is a driving force of the dungeon. But beyond that, Phrasma doesn't take a huge role in the the AP. Yeah. But yeah, it's all since it's undead, through. she'll always be an opposing force to it. So which is kind of her role in the other couple of APs that she kinda touches. Those being Carrying Crown and Mummy's Mask, which are both big undead themed adventure paths where her church plays a role here and there and she has a looming presence because she is tangentially opposed to the undead but again she's just kind of really hands off 
on her involvement in APs. It's not like... It's not like I am Mayday coming down and actually greeting you in an adventure path or running into Desna in an adventure path. It's... She has a looming presence over <clears throat> her. Right. Kind of like Rotus has a looming presence over her. <laughs> That's, that's, I was a little surprised in Carrion Crown, honestly, that there wasn't more Phrasma. And that's not to say that mm -hmm. there's not Phrasma stuff, because you go to Phrasma temples or seek them out, or there's a... I, I, I will speak vaguely about this, even though we are in spoiler territory, but there is a, a very heavily Phrasma-themed dungeon in Book 6. But even still, you're, yeah, absolutely. You don't go to the Boneyard. You don't talk to Phrasma. She doesn't send down, like, her big servitors or anything. If anything, you just kind of interact with some priests and go to locations that are reminiscent of Phrasma. But, yeah, and, and I think that there's even a, like, big carve-out in one of the, in the back matter of one of the books of Carrion Crown for Phrasma. So, like... Yeah. Well, that's the... So the beast they did dead. these big deity articles in the yeah, well, yeah, they that's still what I'm do in the the adventure path back matter. But all the ones for the core deities were done first, and those those big articles, I think they're eight pages long, became the basis for Inner Sea Gods. So it's mm -hmm. just reprinting that information from the adventure path into Inner Sea Gods. Right, but but my point stands that it's like yeah. there's this giant carve out, and really she's not even Just like that. a NPC. She's like a a, a a cloud or looming or whatever that we <laughs> the the looming we've been talking about. <laughs> yeah, she's she's almost like a theme for the NPCs. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, yeah, and, and I, th I think it it kind of fits with her whole her whole her whole shtick of just being a bit more hands off. Yeah. And I'm just going to I'm just going to deal with stuff later. Like Heath said, you know, I'm I'm I'll judge I'm you after to that after death and that's that's where I'll stay. But uh to that point her her planar allies do play a little bit more of a role in a couple adventures. Yes. Malevolence, especially. You yeah. you befriend a, well, hopefully you befriend a, a no soy psychopomp that is just absolutely delightful, named Ezra yeah. Malkin. Fucking hopefully, because that's the only NPC in the goddamn adventure. It's friendly. <laughs> my fighter, my fighter loved my that. Heart, my fighter my loved party that had one member that just did not trust Ezra. <laughs> Well, you're missing out on the one friendly in the building. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> but, yeah, Ezra Malkin's great. Mm -hmm. there, there are psychopumps referenced a lot in Malevolence b for both good and bad, because some of them get corrupted. Mm -hmm. But it I can't recommend Malevolence enough for those of you yeah. listening who haven't listened, who haven't played. Either go out it's... and listen to Link Legacy Malevolence with Steve, or go out and find a group and play it, because it's a really good module. And then... Yeah, the, um, the very first thing that happens in Malevolence, at least for my party, is they come upon the manor. And you just see the the whippoorwills just spiraling mm -hmm. in the Phrasman spiral, this above the manor, and it's and just, then they all die. Yep. Yeah, then no. you touch. The, then you touch. Then you touch the shell, and everything just comes crashing down. It's not my PC yeah. though. My PC just wondered why it was raining birds. <laughs> and then it's the a other rain and birds. That's exactly what I said. The other recent I, module to touch on for asthma a little bit with regards to psychopomps mm -hmm. is uh, it got alluded to earlier. And thank you, Mike, because I completely spaced on her involvement in that adventure. 
Knight of Grey Death, which takes care of the Galt problem. That module is I, I have not played this module, but I read through it, which is something I do when I just when there's something that I like know I'll never play, and I was like, shit, this module fucking slaps. It's Isn't so Isn't it cool. crazy high level? It yeah. was really fun. I ran it for Jason. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's like it's like seventeenth level, right? It is seventeenth yeah. well, sixteenth to eighteenth. <sighs> I think it, uh, is what it's uh, that's awesome. You get like Dude, it's and it, it's a meat grinder. It, it is a meat grinder. Uh, I killed four PCs, beheaded mm -hmm. three of them. <laughs> my my PC is the only one to survive. Yeah, yeah. But uh, psycho pumps play a role there because, as Mike mentioned, Galt is the. For those of you that aren't deep into the lore, Galt is the revolution era France of Galarian, and it's been in e a revolution for like 70 years of just mm -hmm. constant French revolution off with their heads guillotines only these guillotines trap your soul when they cut your head off mm -hmm. and as Mike mentioned Phrasma and the Psychopumps have a problem with people who trap souls and don't allow them to go to to the great beyond. So psychopumps do come and aid you in this adventure and you do fight a lot of sakils which are the the inverse psychopumps, yes. the ones Can't that confirm. feed on fear and on bringing untimely death. Can confirm. They're all gnarly too. Every single one of them is a is a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, they're <laughs> fun. High level. They're yeah, they are fun. As... But yeah, those are the the places where you see a lot more psycho pumps are adventures where where the the natural order of things is being tampered with a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. So all the APs that I've run. Ha there's not really been any psycho pumps, really. So, yeah, it's just the only one. The the big one was uh, malevolence, where there was a lot of Nasoy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Heath, you've re it's been much in Starfinder at all when it comes to like psycho pumps or anything or anything like that for you all, right? Mm, no, not really. I want to say there may have been one in Signal of Screams, but I, ca I can't recall. I feel like I would have recalled if it were, right? Yeah, right. If it was any, it would be sing yeah. Signal of Screams, I just, though. I just haven't... I just, yeah, well, but Signal of Screams is so specifically Zonny K. Yeah. Like, it is... It re it's There's not, like, other deities at work. It is Zonny K. Is, is, All is day. Sort of the driving you know, a catalyst and motivator behind that, that whole AP. Yeah. Which I hate. Yeah. I hate. Because I hate Johnny K. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. Uh, which, is why I'll, which is why I'll probably come join you next week for Johnny K. Or next month for Johnny K. Just to be the voice of dissent, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's I feel like there's a lot of, is, there's a lot of uh, uh, undeserved Johnny K love and fetishism. Right? Like, Sonny <laughs> K is horrible, and you need to be reminded of that. Oh, he is horrible, and that's why I love him. I know. That's why a lot of people love him, and I'm not about it. <laughs> He's absolutely garbage, but... I, so I will say, I was going to bring up earlier, like, doing these with you guys every now and then, I mean, for one, is a delight, but for another... Makes me feel so like milk toast and like so goody two shoes. Cause like in Starfinder, I know I keep referencing like Starfinder deities, but you know what I'm about. But like my favorite deity is Hylax, which is such a like awful good sweetheart deity, you know? But then I also love Demoratosh, who is awful, but is the god of conquest, the Vesk god, you know? Yeah, like, well, and like I like Zonny K, but my favorite god is Desna. And I also yeah. have soft spots in my heart for, you know, Shalin and Ayamede and... Yeah, I like, like Saren Ray a lot. 
<laughs> yeah. I like Sarah in a way. I, I love Sarah in a way qu- quite a bit. Sister Cinder. Sister Cinder and what was... You know this one, Keith. Uh, what did they call her in Slithering? Grandmother... Grandmother Grace? Is it Grandmother Grace? Yeah. Yeah, I'm running the Slithering right now. It's a home game. It's not for the show. Uh, we recently did... Pretty early on, you go and have an interaction with an orc at, who is mm-hmm. worshipping at a shrine of Grandmother yep. Grace. And yeah, I, I, yeah. I loved that aspect of it. That So, Grandmother Grace is just... It's a version of Saren Raid that's been mixed with like ancestor worship, and they've chosen or, or the people that worshipped uh, Saren Raid were, were slaves and didn't have access to their own, you know, to their culture that they came from. They were displaced, and so they their Saren Raid belief uh, or, or Sarenite belief, I guess, fused with local beliefs, and they focus particularly on. Saren Ray's like redemptive qualities, like the, yeah. the whole aspect mm-hmm. of redemption. And so they have re characterized Saren Ray as a kindly old grandmother. <laughs> um, and I thought that was really fascinating. And and because of that, actually, I was talking with a friend of mine who um I I, you know, discuss GMing and, and just lore and stuff with. And there I in the instance of the slithering that I'm running, I'm going to add another shrine to another sort of amalgamation god, right? A, a nice. mixture of two gods because of like local ancestor worship and stuff. And I, I just love that idea because you you read these source books and stuff, and you read about each god, and they're kind of in their own lane, and they become very distinct in your minds. But the real world, like religions, get mixed up, you know, and like cultures mm-hmm. cross over, and and I love that aspect so much that that it's actually represented in the slithering of like, hey, this is based on this deity, but it's mixed with these other beliefs. And I was like, I want to do more of that, you so, know? So there's, very similar. Yeah, there's, it's very similar in Quest for the Frozen Flame, which I know you played a little bit too, Heath. Oh, they man, are, they... I played like two sessions and literally like, so we wanted, I was, that's why I was like making a nod to, uh, to Steve earlier about, uh, somebody doing an adventure that we wanted to do because we wanted to do that adventure for our 2E show. We, we have announced we're going to do a 2E show for the STF network in you know the upcoming months, I think. But we that was what we wanted to do. And what was funny is so me and John from the network, Adam was all about it. Adam was selling it to us and we were like, Yes, let's let let's try it out. But he was like, "Okay, well, we'll have to like make characters. It'll be a process." And we had just fin- finished uh, recording an episode of our show, and everybody else left, and it was me, John, and Adam. And I was just like, "Well, are y'all are y'all busy? Like, are y'all chilling?" And they're like, "Yeah, just hanging out." I was like, "Well, why don't we just make some characters right now, and then they'll be ready to go?" And we ended up, John and I each made two characters and convinced Adam to let us. Let's just start it. Let's just play a party of four with two people and go ahead and start this adventure we're all excited about. And we made silly joke characters, but we did about uh, like two episodes of it. And I went down to New Orleans where John and Adam live for an event. And like I came in the door and Adam's sitting on the couch and immediately started talking about that adventure. And I was like, Adam, stop we need to stop playing this right now so we can do it for the show. Like we don't need to go any further in this adventure. And he was like, yeah, I think you're right. And like a week or two later, somebody else did it that made it to where we didn't want to do it. And it, it was a whole thing, but like we got really wrapped up in it and excited, but we, we wisely, to our minds wisely at the time stopped. We, we really kind of prided ourselves on having the uh, wherewithal to like, hey, the willpower. We have, so we have the self-control to stop right now so we can do this and do something good for the network. And then it didn't end up mattering. So, But um, in in there, there's a there's another aspect of Saren Ray that's very much an amalgamation. Uh, she goes by the name of Sister Cinder. And it's, again, it's the cultural, you know, right the the the, this nomadic tribe they worship the fire aspect of her because you're you're nomads living in a tundra right so fire fire is is life life. right yeah yeah Yeah, that's really cool i I just i assumed from sister cinder i was like oh like my brain immediately i was like oh they they took the sarin rain just took the fire Mm -hmm. nothing but the fire you know i like that 
still one of my biggest. That's another thing I like about Starfinder is Saren Ray worship is really prevalent on the sun because, like, of course it is. (laughs) Wait, you mean like the sun, sun, like the the sun? Yeah. So, so their sun, if you don't know, has a system of bubble cities, so you can literally live your life. You can be born on the sun, and they. There's a that was one the second I believe adventure path after Dead Suns oh. was Dawn of Flame, and the entire thing takes place on or in the sun. Okay. And you go through the first like half of the adventure path, you go through multiple different bubble cities, and they all have their own vibe. There's like a Castrovellian, like Lashunta kind of elvish vibe city or hmm. bubble city, and then there's like a, you know, like. Charles Dickens like workshop like everybody's working in horrible <laughs> conditions bubble city kind of thing <sighs> yeah wow. anything else otherwise we'll just I will say that the my biggest heartbreaking gaming one of my biggest heartbreaking gaming happened just recently with a uh, quest for a frozen flame Jason just want to let you know that one of my biggest yeah. heartbreaks one of my well, I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna hit the stop button. Then, Go ahead, and then we well, then you can we can talk about it. Well, hey, before uh, you do, to... before you hit the stop button, I just want to say thanks for having me on. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. I never get to be the guests on stuff like this, so uh, it's just fun nah, shooting the shit well, with y'all. Thank you for having we're me gonna, on, all y'all. We're gonna have you on again, yeah, Steve. You've, you've never been a Eric guest on you. anyone else's shows ever. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you haven't had me on in so long. Come on, <laughs> yeah. it's been a while, and I need to have you yeah, back on. No. Too, so. It was a pleasure having you. 